So this is video one of our study of Emerson's essay, Compensation. The entire series is called Do the Thing, and this particular video focuses on the distinction between internal and external goods. So Emerson starts the essay with this discussion of the Last Judgment, and I think it's you know sort of explicit, so, sort of implicit question. I would phrase it this way, right? Are good people compensated in their goodness, for their goodness, or not rewarded. So three options there, in their goodness, for their goodness, or not rewarded at all. That begs the question, uh, what is the difference between being compensated for an act and being compensated in an act? So we're going to have to address that. Internal goods are the goods that are enjoyed in the act of doing something. In particular, it seems that the more complex and the richer uh, and the, the, the act and the more it requires of you, uh, the more internal goods are possible in it. Uh, playing chess has a lot more internal goods than playing Go Fish, which has very few, for instance. There's only one way to get the goods from playing chess, and it's to play chess. External goods come from outside, money, popularity, prestige. Uh, often these are very generic. Five dollars is five dollars is five dollars. Popularity is kind of specific, kind of general. They're far more general. They come from the outside of the act. So the doctrine of the last judgment assumes that people are compensated for their acts, but not in their acts. So you know, you've, you've done something that's allegedly good, but you need to be rewarded for it externally because the compensation wasn't in the doing. So internal goods are done, are compensated in the doing. External goods come from outside and might be tied to the doing in some way. But so the doctrine of the last judgment assumes that you're compensated for the good or the wickedness that you did, because otherwise you wouldn't need to balance the books because it would have been in the deed. So Emerson concludes that you know, our common understandings that, uh, at least the theoretical understandings in, in his time uh, of, of morality um, uh, show that the good isn't really good. It's not, there's no goodness in the good. It's just this weird, uh, bizarre attempt by people to, to, uh, manipulate other people through language and maybe even themselves manipulate themselves to get them to behave in certain ways that appear to be necessary but that aren't good so you invent this other mechanism where you get rewarded or punished later for your deed but what could that mean other than that the good isn't good and that wickedness isn't wicked and of course we've got 90% of our boys have this suspicion uh, uh, to, a good, to a good degree, right? If not uh, outright belief that that is true. And that is a huge problem for the home team. And I think Emerson's pervading tone through these opening pages is, you know, let's cut the crap, you know, no more baloney either praying and praising, loving and serving men are good, and then let's do them, or they're not good, and then let's stop lying about it. Let's just stop lying about ethics and morality and figure out the truth and tell the truth. So it might help here to try to get at, you know, what exactly would be internal compensation, like who would have internal compensation? Is this a flaw that, that it's this way or that we're this way, that we need this external compensation? Like, what's going on here? So, again, maybe these questions will help. What is God's compensation for creating the universe? Does he get paid? Does he get some sort of external compensation? 
you know, I've I've heard from from David Brown that in in you know in the Bible in in some traditions it's you know the praise of his creation, uh, but again, wow, that that really makes to makes God out to be kind of low, it seems to me. But anyway, uh, I think from Emerson's point of view, God doesn't have any compensation for creating the universe, right? Other than the internal goods of doing it. So that would be a good example. You know, could you imagine God selling off the the universe? after he grew it like a corporation or something like, you know, what, what's he doing? How would one reward Jesus in heaven for his extraordinary love and service? Again, hookers and, and cocaine. Like what exactly would you give Jesus to reward him for loving people? I mean, Jesus is just going to want to like love people more, right? That's what he's going to do in heaven. He's what he was doing on earth because it's good to do. What is Michelangelo's compensation for painting the Sistine Chapel? Well, I'm sure you know he gets fame, and there might be part of him that likes that fame, and he, he gets some money, and part of him that likes that money. But he also gets to paint the ceiling, right? He gets to paint the wall. He gets to paint the Sistine Chapel. That act of creation, that's his. That's him uh, self-engaged. That's him producing out of his own being more world. What is a good father's compensation for his good fathering? Well, again, there, there can be external uh, compensation for that, for sure. And there's sort of genetic compensation for it. But there's also the building of another person, right? Imagine a dad taking $10 to father his own child. Strange idea. What is your compensation for building something that you love? A friendship, a team, a robot, a skill? Try to ask questions that get the boys to that space where, oh, wow, I, I have something or two things or three things or four activities that I do or more that, uh, that I, I'm like God. You know, I, I do them for the love of the world that happens when I do them. And, uh, you know, that's a good thing to get the boys to understand. And if some of them are going to have a bunch of those things already and some aren't. So takeaways for this video, uh, you should be able to define an external good, define an internal good, answer the question, what is the essential difference between being compensated in an act versus being compensated for an act? And you should be able to explain Emerson's critique of traditional understandings of the Last Judgment.